Next up, we have Katrina Fenlon, Diana Marsh, and Nikki Wise from the University of Maryland College of Information, and they will be speaking to us about linked data and anthropological archives, learning from motives across disciplines. Katrina? Oh, um, thanks. I kick us off. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, great to see everyone. Thanks, uh, folks, for being here. Um, so we're really excited to talk uh, with this particular group and sort of um, engage with you all about this topic. Um, I'm Diana Marsh. I'm an assistant professor in archives and digital curation here at the University of Maryland. And for the context for this talk, I should probably say um, my PhD is in museum anthropology. And I sometimes tell people I'm a recovering anthropologist. Um, and I'm also um, co-chair for the Council on the Preservation of Anthropological Records, which we'll talk more about, but essentially a group in the 90s that tried to get anthropologists interested in records and data, and that um, Ricky Puncelon, uh, who's at Michigan, and myself have been trying to wrangle to be more community-focused and um, kind of data curation-focused over the last several years, and I'm also um, on the new Society of American Archivists Archival Repatriation Committee. And I'll pass it to Katrina. Hey, everybody. Katrina Fenlon, Assistant Professor at the University of Maryland College of Information. My background is in library information science, and I am really happy to see some of my colleagues from the University of Illinois, which is my alma mater here. <laughs> Good to see everybody. And I'll hand it off to Nikki. Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Maryland. Uh, my background is archaeology. So, um, yeah, so this is what I've been working on. Okay, and we're off to the races. First slide. Um, before we begin or sort of say anything else, we want to start by acknowledging the Piscataway and the Kashtank on whose land we're meeting today and the other indigenous peoples across Indian country and across the globe whose collections and data are represented in the repositories that we'll be talking about today. Um, and we especially want to acknowledge the separation and that colonial assimilation and genocide generated between indigenous nations and homelands and the role that anthropologists and um, cultural heritage institutions played in that project. We want to acknowledge the power and resilience of communities and nations and want to thank various nations and indigenous colleagues for their collaboration and patience and grace as we work toward knowledge reclamation in this area. Um, and for everyone here today, uh, we invite you to share whose land you're located on in chat. Uh, you can go to nativeland.ca. Um, and we'd also like to invite you to donate to the Akakik Foundation, which um, has been doing really amazing both environmental um, and um, cultural reclamation work with local indigenous and Piscataway nations here in Maryland. Um, so today, this is the um, sort of rundown of where we're taking you all. We're going to start talking a little bit about anthropology and sort of the weirdnesses and nuances in colonial histories of anthropology. We'll talk a little bit about its existing data infrastructures um, and particularly in archives and why that's unique. Um, and then we'll think about um, why generally we got interested in looking at linked data and then go through sort of our research questions, methods and findings and kind of where we're at with this stage of the project. And we'd like to end with asking you all to participate. So um, if you hear things that seem familiar to you, or if you think there's a work that you're doing that uh, we should know more about, uh, we'd like to invite you all to um, tell us about that and we can then be in touch with you after today. Okay, so um, for folks who haven't um, spent much time um, in anthropology with anthropologists, just to give you a quick breakdown of the basics of some of the disciplines and subdisciplines related to anthropology. So in the Americanist tradition, uh, we usually think of anthropology as having four subfields. So archeological, uh, cultural, and quote unquote ethnological, although not a term used as often uh, anymore, linguistic and biological. So um, that, and there's also kind of within any of those fields, there are folks who do more applied anthropology. So doing kind of work with, or sort of grounded in different practices and communities, um, and folks who are kind of more on the, the academic end of that. Um, and importantly, um, 
that means that the range of materials that are used to do work in anthropology are pretty broad. So um, literally people working with bones and fossils uh, and various museum specimens, um, folks working with um, historical material culture, folks working with contemporary linguistic material, um, folks working today in, you know, corporations doing ethnography of Marriott, you know, so it's a really um, hugely various wide ranging discipline that sits at the intersection of um, social sciences. There's lots of folks in anthropology that see themselves as social scientists, humanities, lots of folks on the cultural side or the museum side where I came from see themselves as humanists and uh, scientists, people who really see themselves as um, kind of in the hard sciences, especially in biological, forensic, and uh, sort of these other um, subfields of anthropology. Um, and the evidence range, you know, again, specimens to field notes and kind of everything in between. Um, also, uh, it cannot be understated that all of the work that has been going on in anthropology over the last many hundreds of years, and certainly in the last um, 150 plus years since it sort of became a bona fide discipline have been going on in the context of genocide and assimilation and knowledge extraction and often in this uh, model of salvage anthropology um, in the idea that you are documenting um, essentially quote unquote disappearing cultures, which of course was happening in support of the colonial project and all that documentation helped to support the colonial project. So collection that were um, taken and documented throughout their life cycle were collected in a colonial paradigm. And that's just important to, to know and acknowledge as the context for everything we're talking about. That's fine. Um, and of course, today materials are increasingly born digital. People working in these fields are doing, you know, largely born digital, making born digital data, but um, those vast collections over the past um, and the hundreds of years are largely still held in analog collections amassed by anthropologists and then brought into archival repositories um, and into some kind of cataloging or descriptive system and still largely served and accessed in physical research or reading rooms. Next slide. Um, so that um, sort of documentation is often unique. Um, irreplaceable cultural information or human information collected in the field with various degrees of ethical failures, um, largely held in physical archives in media formats that can be difficult to digitize because often they're bound or have these other sort of conservation needs. Um, and they're often organized within the collections of white um, collectors or creators. So here's the classic uh, anthropologist and his wife in the field tent, uh, you know, doing their field notes after, you know, after dinner, et cetera. Um, and uh, those collections often get distributed um, across the globe to different archival repositories. You can imagine that the knowledge or um, collections of any one um, indigenous community or any, any kind of descendant community would be held then in uh, many different archives, depending on whether that person was a member of a intellectual society or held multiple university positions or worked for the government at various points. And those things uh, end up sort of in this process of archival diaspora dispersed all over. Um, and I, I just always love this photo and archivists I used to work with at the National Anthropological Archives love this photo. Um, given the scale of colonial collecting, particularly in the late 19th and 20th century um, and the sort of explosion of bureaucratic paperwork, um, curac curation practices have not always been stellar in these fields. Um, and then uh, of course, um, all of that knowledge has to be represented in different cataloging systems. Um, and we're largely talking about um, what we, what archivists would call archives. So largely um, collections, that at least the motivation for this research came out of thinking about these collections um, that are often paper, photographs, audio recordings, um, and things that are represented in finding aids, which um, research has shown are not intuitive even for graduate educated researchers. They're often processed at this super abstracted level. Um, so uh, basically only 30% are processed at all. You have to go to each institution to get access to them. Historically, there's been this kind of culture of gatekeeping um, in these pretty, um, you know, colonial spaces uh, that require, you know, appointment and um, ID. And it's important to note the difference um, often between that and bibliographic cataloging. If, um, folks have read work by Greg Wiedemann, who talks a lot about the sort of inherent differences in archival description. 
next slide. Um, and then uh, in a reality, I'm sure lots of us are keenly aware of, uh, many of those materials will never be digitized. So this is a great, um, this is the uh, uh, record group creator from the National Archives, which is scanning at an astounding rate. And yet uh, not even 2% of their collections are digitized, uh, which is um, 228 million <laughs> uh, scans is, is not even 2%. So we're just not really um, getting to the place where things are, are largely digitized or described at an IDAB level online. So we're in this part of the motivation for this project was thinking about like, can we improve community access without um, capital D digitization? And can we also meet archival institutions and communities where they're at? Um, of course, in the meantime, um, anthropology, like most other uh, disciplines, has um, become really interested in creating digital archives. Um, they're really interested in data reuse. There's a lot of um, sort of emphasis on data reuse across anthropology. Um, anthropology also acknowledges its own quote unquote curation crisis. Um, in part because there's just so much material in all these different repositories and there's lots of efforts um, to build digital repositories that hold um, digital data. Next slide. So uh, yeah, um, so I'll take over here. So the rationale for focusing on linked data as a component of infrastructure for anthropology stems from its capacity to enable more points of access, community engagement, um, potentially better description and translation across linguistic boundaries, across disciplinary boundaries. And Diana's characterized data within anthropological archives as being widely distributed, um, largely undiscoverable. And we're illustrating this point partly with this map on the screen from the We Are Here Sharing Stories project, which is an effort to digitize indigenous related items in the holdings of Library and Archives Canada illustrating how indigenous materials end up in colonial collections that are scattered far and wide and disconnected from one another. And of course, linked data have the capacity to forge connections across the sub-disciplines and cognate disciplines of anthropology that might draw on these resources, but especially among and with the communities whose data are in these archives. And these collections often represent important evidence for efforts toward repatriation and land claims among native and indigenous communities. Linked data can support decolonizing efforts in data representation, um, the implementation of fair and care principles and best practices, the recognition of indigenous data sovereignty, and enable communities to participate in description of their collections and reclaim ownership of their data to some degree, even as the items are still held in colonial um, institutions. And in addition to that, um, linked data affords the opportunity for connecting historical items to data and to related secondary sources um, uh, in, in, uh, in the world of publishing. So, the, and yet, despite all of this, the approaches that we're aware of are too heavyweight for um, most anthropological archives and too institutionally focused to engage communities meaningfully. Sorry about that, the map just appeared that I was referencing. So this is the We Are Here Sharing Stories project that I referenced that shows the distribution of the indigenous collections in Canada. Um, so we're acutely aware that the challenges and the solutions in this space are not primarily or exclusively technological and linked data is not a cure-all. Um, the adoption of linked data tends to be too heavyweight for institutions, too institutionally focused for communities. And so it's this confluence of opportunities and challenges um, that motivates our research. So there are a broader set of research questions that are guiding these phases of the project. Um, but for this first phase that we're speaking about today, which is about understanding the state of the field, we focus on this question around how anthropologists and archivists are adapting established and emergent digital curation best practices and ethical principles to anthropology. And also what can we learn from other disciplines? So this is not only about the state of practices in anthropology and its archives, or in cultural heritage more broadly, but also about intersecting disciplines. Um, as Diana described, anthropological evidence encompasses not only the cultural records, but also evidence that might be more familiar from the sciences and social sciences like specimens. And we know that the subdisciplines align with sciences and social sciences as umbrellas in addition to the humanities. So we're taking a broad view and looking for peer projects and relevant guidance and workflows 
So in year one, we were a small group of four all at the University of Maryland College of Information. Three of us have some level of background or advanced degrees in anthropology and archaeology and museum studies. Um, but throughout this project, from the development of the grant proposal through the first year of research and continuing now, we've been collaborating with the National Anthropological Archives, which has done some preliminary work in this area. And we are advised by the Council for the Preservation of Anthropological Records Working Group and the Advisory Board, which includes Indigenous membership as well as anthropological and curation expertise. In year two, we've been super excited to just add a cohort of research assistants from wide ranging academic and community backgrounds. I think at least one of them is here in the room with us. Hi, Candy. Um, to add some disciplinary perspectives, connections to and expertise in relation to more indigenous communities and new connections to cultural collections. And we're really grateful for the team of collaborators that's listed on the slide here. So um, in the year one, we were sort of looking around and saying, okay, what's the state of the field? And um, uh, having been in the field uh, of anthropology, there's a tendency sometimes to sort of feel like you're a special snowflake. And so we thought, you know what, let's look out and see what other disciplines are doing. Um, these are shared problems across lots of other fields. And so we did a systematized search and review process to look at how um, primary sources were being um, how linked data was being utilized for primary sources across the um, sciences and social sciences, um, just to sort of see um, how it was working elsewhere and kind of what's the state of the art uh, in across different disciplines. Um, and we, we defined primary sources fairly broadly, but I'll let uh, Nikki talk more about that. Um, in year two, we um, have planned to actually work with what we're calling test collections. And we're not sure exactly what that's going to look like, but we had this idea to essentially look at collections that are um, really granularly described, so maybe fully digitized and transcribed, collections that are modestly <laughs> described in the way that most archival collections often are, which is like, you know, some kind of finding aid, but really sort of described at an abstract level, and then maybe something with a really limited set of description, uh, maybe just a mark record or something like that. Um, but we want to do all of that work um, really closely in part community partnership um, with folks who are represented by those collections. And so we want to spend um, a bunch of time this year thinking about strategically about how to do that and how to do that ethically. Um, and uh, I'll just um, also say that um, in case anyone's asking the question, in the first year, uh, we did not have a, a, a sort of standalone Indigenous advisory board. Um, and the reason for that is in part because we have this COPAR group, um, but also as someone who works on lots of Indigenous projects, um, that sort of load, the workload and cultural load of a lot of my colleagues um, who are already on like eight other Indigenous advisory boards, uh, we felt like in the first year, this was homework, you know, we as uh, allies could do and go out and sort of be responsible and then to, um, to sort of take that and then shape the rest of the project. And so in year two and three is when we're starting to do more outreach and um, hopefully build some um, tribal partnerships as part of the work. Um, and I should also say we're going to have um, we're really excited to have just a lot of kind of um, memoing and diarying to look at um, different platforms and sort of play or just do some experimentation around like what we can do uh, with different linked data approaches to working with collections. Yeah, so there's been, of course, a lot of work on linked data and cultural heritage contexts coming both from GLAM and from the domain of digital humanities, um, research about applications of linked data, um, case studies of implementation. Of course, we've seen some really inspiring work at this conference already, um, very exciting. And so embarking on this study, which is a cross-disciplinary study, we had reviews of prior work to take advantage of in the cultural domain, but we found less about the landscape of linked data in the sciences and social sciences, especially in relation to linked data drawn from primary sources in the sciences and social sciences, um, which is a niche of evidence in those fields, but an important one. And so this became the scope of our study, which Nikki will tell you a little more about. Yes, yeah, so we did a systematic search and review of linked data projects in the sciences and social sciences. We use, uh, So this is an image of our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, we use websites, articles, informal publications, and funding reports to gather information about projects. And first we generated potential projects 
from the recovery and reuse of archival data for science project. And we also incorporated projects that were recommended from the COPAR working group. We then conducted a systematized search and review using Google, Google Scholar, and Bing. Uh, so we were searching for linked data projects drawing on primary sources, defining primary sources as an original documentary, artifactual, or specimen source of evidence. We only included primary sources that were held in memory institutions. We also limited projects to being in English and being active within the last five years. So at 2023, that was from 2018 or onward. In terms of the population, we were in, we included those who created, led, or maintained the project and excluded those who simply joined larger initiatives or projects. Projects were also included if they connected to if they connected analog or digitized material to the broader web and used linked data to share materials within science and social science disciplines. We excluded the humanities. Oh, go back. Sorry. sorry. We excluded the humanities because there has been substantial work on linked data projects and innovations already in the humanities. Of course, there are many projects that blur the lines, and we discussed these as a team, all the borderline cases, and came to an agreement about whether they met our criteria and could shed light on our research question. Next slide. So here is a are the list of disciplines we use for the science and social sciences. Many projects uh, identified themselves as a subdiscipline of one of these larger, broader disciplines. We used Kelly et al's list of science disciplines. And then for social science disciplines, we use the National Center of Education Statistics list. So these are what we categorize projects as based on their own identification. Next slide. So here's a screenshot, sh screenshot of uh, an example of our data set uh, showing, you can see the project name, the coder and quality checker, uh, and codes for each about if they meet the our inclusion criteria. So the whys that say yes, that they those are our inclusion criteria. We also have codes for their discipline, the project's reasoning for using linked data in their own words, and the standards that they may or might may not be using for linked data. So during the search, we identified 303 projects, and through review, we ruled out 268. So most of the projects we found were ruled out. Many projects were ultimately excluded because the project was either was primarily focused on cultural heritage materials. The primary sources were not being held in a memory institution. The project may have not been active during the last five years, or the project was not implementing linked data in a true sense. Next slide. So here are just some selected projects from our data set, including open context, archaeological Archaeology Data Service, Open, Biodiv, and Binomia. As you can see, many of these are actually within archaeology or biological sciences. Next slide. So among the projects that we reviewed, uh, we thought it'd be interesting to sort of look at what are the types of primary sources that are being utilized by different disciplines. Um, and you can see from this breakdown, um, majority here, as Nikki sort of just alluded to, were what folks in sciences would consider specimens. You can see we've distinguished that from objects and belongings in part because of that, the ethical stance that most cultural um, or sort of social science projects take in relation to community materials. Um, but a lot of focus on things, frankly, held in museums, um, which we thought was pretty interesting. Um, some uh, next up were sort of paper and sort of like textual, largely textual materials. Um, and then followed by photographs. And then the last category we have is kind of like historical publications and, and rare books, um, which were sort of least common among the sets that we evaluated. Okay, so um, Nikki showed you a little preview of our data analysis and the types of things we were looking for. We're gonna just talk about one uh, type of thing we were looking for today, which is the motives that are driving the adoption of linked data in this specific context, in the context of um, primary source collection serving the sciences and social sciences. So we found these four overarching themes and why these projects are deploying linked data. And within each category, we found several or up to a dozen distinct motivations cited in how projects are describing their own objectives. So I'll be talking through those in just a moment. But the main things you'll notice as we talk about the motives that we found is that these are idealized motivations. Most of these are projects talking about what they hope to accomplish through the use of linked data um, by the end of the project. So um, it's not necessarily an evaluation of the success of linked data to those ends or whether linked data is the best fit for those ends. 
Um, but these are the motivations um, that are driving linked data in this context. And many of them will be familiar to everyone in this audience. They're the motivations that also bring many of us to this conference and to this community. And these are confirmed here, but there are some things that stand out. Um, the balance among these higher order motivations um, interpretation and analysis is a particularly granular set of motivations driving the adoption of linked data for the sciences um, and specific opportunities for scientific and social scientific data reuse. So um, I don't want you to try to read the slide. We're going to break this down further in just a minute, but just wanted to give you this visual overview of how these four themes and the sub themes that are there interrelated to give you a sense of how many express motivations we found across these themes. And um, each of these categories is feeding into the others. So the motives related to digital curation are foundational to everything else. And really aspects of discovery and access are feeding into, and in some cases reappearing under headings of interpretation and analysis and reuse as well as other contexts. So let's dive into each of these four categories. Okay, so these motivations for the adoption of linked data are dear to the hearts of many in this LD4 community who work in libraries, archives, data repositories, the data curation imperatives that are driving the adoption of linked data in the sciences and social sciences. And these are the ones that are feeding back into and supporting the other facets of use and reuse that we found. Um, so our projects, um, they cited wanting to accomplish familiar objectives, um, parallel to what we see in the realm of cultural heritage, including things like promoting adherence to the FAIR data principles, aligning data standards internationally and across different domains of use, um, unifying access and discovery, but while preserving original localized contexts or the brand and ownership among original collections and promoting technical sustainability for data or for research infrastructure. So not just accessibility, but like persistent discoverability, sustainable discoverability and access. And um, we also found some distinctive things, some interest in supporting data related process automation, um, supporting archiving processes among scientists. So publishing data and then archiving data uh, by scientists and social scientists themselves. Some projects were attempting to use linked data to sort of ease that set of practices, in, including integrating data with publications. Um, and also um, linked data as a tool for assigning um, credit and attribution to more granular aspects of research projects. So research um, workflows, research data, um, in part to support things like the assessment of scientific impact. So these were motives we identified related to data curation. Motives among scientists and social scientists in relation to discovery and access, um, things like expanding access globally across languages among source communities, um, connecting data to other relevant data across domains to, to support discovery, and then supporting community engagement and public exploration of the data in part to promote cultural understanding. Um, and then these some somewhat to us more distinctive aspects of what was motivating the drive um, towards linked data, including trying to um, promote more equity in access to small and large collections resources, which includes you know, more points of access that allow for communities to meet communities where they are. Um, virtual reassembly or virtual reunification of scattered artifacts or collections or pieces of um, belongings and adapting different discovery mechanisms or platforms to different community needs. These were all cited as rationale for um, the adoption of linked data in this, in this space. After discovery and access, we looked at their motives in relation to interpretation and analysis. So things like connecting data to primary and secondary sources to support new types of analysis, new um, knowledge discovery, um, allowing for integration with reference sources like genetic data sources, georeferencing, gazetteers, that kind of thing um, to support analysis. Um, but then things also um, supporting machine learning and AI, supporting more complex querying than is possible with other um, forms of data representation, um, custom analytic workflows that are really tailored to the needs of scholars in one specific subfield or focused on one specific kind of research question, um, connecting scientific data and research 
from present day and ongoing research to historical um, data and sources. And of course, being able to record and represent and reconcile potentially conflicting interpretations or representations of data or dimensions of data. And finally, after the motives behind um, data curation and discovery and interpretation and analysis are their motives related to reuse, so supporting novel kinds of reuse or open-ended reuse, including um, supporting efforts towards scientific reproducibility and transparency, promoting trust in science, um, supporting unanticipated forms of reuse among researchers in different sectors, so not just in academia, but also in the public and, um, and in industry. And in some cases, projects just wanted to be part of open access movements, be part of open science, or to facilitate direct engagement with collections through user contributions, um, allowing users to add their own perspectives to data, um, including you know, manual or automated forms of annotation. So this is the very broad range of motivations that we found in our analysis of the um, of the data set that we've gathered so far. Um, we have more to analyze and more to do in relation to this data set. Um, and then also, of course, as Diana mentioned, um, more planned data collection, including user evaluation. So we're undertaking, Diana had described that how in this current year, we are moving from the phase of systematic review into actually doing some experimentation with real world test collections in partnership with communities, in partnership with archives, and uh, conducting user studies um, based on our experiments with those collections. And then in our final year, the project will be hosting a symposium, trying to triangulate what we've learned with our core communities and working with the American Anthropological Association on training modules, two training modules that can serve anthropologists as data creators, archivists and collection managers, but also community-based um, researchers and anthropological researchers. And just to sort of summarize the overarching objectives of this project, our goal is to explore ways to adapt emergent linked data infrastructures that will move archival repositories beyond you know, digitization projects, which can only tackle a really small percentage of collections, beyond single institution projects, um, and to do this movement in a way that's more sustainable. So we're thinking about how to apply linked data for anthropology's archives to allow for surfacing and amplifying voices and knowledge that are documented in collections, and then forging those connections among them, interlinking them um, through these constellations of relationships and institutions and publications and data sets across the web, um, all for discovery and reuse by a range of communities. So if you have projects in mind, and at this point we're not no longer limiting our focus to the sciences and social sciences, but projects in mind from any domain that seem related to this work, um, whether they're yours or someone else's, we would love to hear about them. Pass it back to Diana. Um, so thank you all so much. And yeah, again, please do um, fill out our form if you think you're working on projects that we should be hearing about. Um, and if you can go to the last slide, I'll do um, our final thanks. So um, first and foremost, um, thank you to the National Science Foundation and the Cultural Anthropology Program. Um, we are just really grateful to be able to be working on this project and thinking big picture about these issues. Um, huge thanks to Amanda Sorensen, who um, was our full-time GA on this project last year, and also to Samantha Lee, who um, Amanda and Samantha both worked on the grant application uh, with me, and then later Katrina uh, two years ago. So thanks to them. Um, Chad Smith, who did some of those illustrations, to our research support team at UMD, Mora, Polly, Susan, um, our COPAR working group, you can see here, our advi COPAR advisory board, um, Smithsonian collaborators, and then our collaborators at the American Anthropological Association. And thanks to our new uh, research assistant team, uh, some of whom may be in the room. Uh, we're excited to have um, more uh, folks to be working on this project with us. So thanks, everybody.
Very happy to take questions. We'd love to hear from you, whether it's, you know, via the form, which I put into the chat, or now in our discussion time that we have remaining um, about any projects you know of that are relevant to this work. We're in the phase of trying to build connections and trying to do outreach and find our peer projects. So um, we'd love to hear more from you and, and we welcome any questions you have. Feel free to post your questions in the Zoom chat or the Slack chat or to raise your hand. Thank you for that comment, Jessica. Um, I have a question for the room, which is any chance anyone here is affiliated with any of the projects that we showed on the screen? <laughs> we had a lot of icons in the presentation. <laughs> I was just going to say, you called out um, Pacioelli, who is our co-director for the Semantic Lab. So I, we typically do uh, cultural heritage, like jazz, uh, EAT, with like Robert Rauschenberg. So kind of like a, a very varied <laughs> domain uh, uh, ecosystem landscape that we're we're dealing with, but we can appreciate uh, working in, in like other domains that maybe typically don't have a lot of, you know, you know, you don't have like a necessarily like North Star to kind of look towards as like how best to go about it. So just appreciate your work and your know, methodology to kind of move through the process and understand like what works best or what what doesn't work best. Um, and I guess I'll just quickly ask, is there a particular outcome that you've been surprised with that, you know, the linked, linked open data has allowed you to do that maybe couldn't have been done in, in your archival or archival practices before or is sold too early to tell? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say, I'll give my response, but I would love to hear Diana and Nikki, if you have other um, responses to add. I think for me, um, I think I, I have been a ardent fan of linked data initiatives for a long time. But without having done a systematic review, I think I had in my mind about half of these motivations. And in retrospect, all of them make intuitive sense. Um, but I don't think I had realized the full scope of what might be possible with the adoption of linked data. Um, in terms of surprising findings, for me, I was expecting to find more <laughs> in the sciences and social sciences. I, I mean, we did narrow our criteria um, in terms of projects that were similar enough that they were important for us to review in such a way that it really narrowed our data set a lot. But um, I was still um, surprised, somewhat surprised not to find, um, yeah, more or more well-established or um, wider spread initiatives to represent primary sources as data in those fields of work, um, especially given how many um, motives that were related to interpretation and analysis, which is really at the core of this. I mean, it's not surprising to me when scientists and social scientists make choices that deprioritize data curation. That's not surprising. That's not their main job. But when they, um, you know, are choosing other methods of representing data, um, despite the the suggested benefits and motives around linked data for interpretation analysis, that was more surprising to me. Um, of course, they're finding other ways to, to realize some of those benefits through other kinds of data architectures, but um, yeah, that was my surprising thing. Yeah, I think um, I, I was sort of, um, and maybe it's also because I've now come to think of archives as too special a snowflake. Um, I was sort of surprised to see so many of the folks in, particularly in museums uh, in sort of scientific projects in museums feeling, having similar um, reservations or challenges to linked data um, uh, adoption or infrastructures 
that we see in archives. And actually, um, I appreciate, Christy, you posting this question about the NAFAN project, the National Finding Aid Network project. One of the things that that, um, that project um, run by uh, OCLC and um, the, uh, I want to say, California Digital Library and some other folks, um, they've got a bunch of reports online, which are really great. Um, and uh, one of the things they've said in their final report is that there's a lot of anxiety around like the sustainability and the feasibility of um, of archival repositories um, buying into these kind of systems and who's going to support them. And um, especially where there's sort of like a culture of, um, monet, you know, sort of needing to have some sort of monetized uh, incentive for these things. And um, so I think it was sort of um, helpful to know that we've got a bigger crowd of collaborators and co-conspirators in the space who we can be learning from. And um, and I will say, um, also just a side note on the NAFAN um, project, there's a really great quote in there that is probably my favorite quote about archival description. And it says from a user and it says, um, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack and the box is just labeled haystack. And um, I think that's that's to me like sort of the issue with especially a lot of this very abstracted um, description in a nutshell when a lot of the work we're trying to do presumes a much more item level um, attention to description um, and interest in the things in the, at the item level. Um, and I will say the last thing is that I think for a long time in anthropology, there was an assumption that um, Native and Indigenous colleagues didn't want to talk about data. And I think the Indigenous data sovereignty movement has fully like scrapped that whole line of, of thinking and has allowed us to be much more creative. And I think a lot of, um, you know, tribal archives and other folks are really interested in thinking about how to leverage these technologies and um, in ways that are feasible um, to locate a lot of their heritage materials and things like that. So that's been kind of a cool sort of general thing that's happening alongside the work we're doing. Uh, thanks for that, Diana. I noticed that May had earlier raised her hand. May, did you still want to ask a question or make an observation? Hi, sorry, I'm just running off this my phone, so um, I'm a little bit have I'm a little bit uh, uncoordinated. I just wanted to uh, say thank you to uh, Katrina and the team who presented there. I'm very loosely affiliated with Links, um, so uh, really excited to see your work in doing um, a kind of ecosystem analysis. We are also. Um, involved in um, a, a, uh, a a grant uh, funded project called Forward Linking, which I'll add to the chat um, uh, where we're doing an ecosystem analysis as well. We have more of a focus on humanities, but I think some of the work that you're, you've done so far will be something that we would include in our ecosystem analysis. So really happy to see uh, the logo featured there. Awesome. Uh -huh. And um, thank you for letting us know, May, and I'm very eager to learn more about forward linking. So please do share the info about that in the chat. Um, about links, I'll say we've been talking about wanting to connect with links for so long. We're so excited about what links is doing. And um, we were at the DH conference this year um, where the keynote was about what's happening with links. And so it's on our short list of platforms we're hoping to directly engage with and experiment with given the um, time and given the right collections to fit that um, that platform um, and and uh, yeah, if if things work out. But yeah, that's great to hear. And thank you for sharing that that new project. Okay, we have one last question um, in the Zoom chat. It is, do you think the lack of a standard technology stack or even something like a vendor product to do what you wanna do has held back similar efforts from using linked data? Hmm, that's a really good question, Laura. Thank you for that question. Um, I'll give my take. I don't know what Diana said. I, I wonder if we're going to agree on this. Um, I think my take is that, and I'm basing this partly on the systematic review we did in the sciences, and partly on my knowledge of what's happening in the digital humanities space. My experience is that creating the perfect common infrastructure is like tilting at windmills. It's just not 
it's never really been feasible because each of these experimental projects we're looking at is trying to do something a little different. Um, I do think that there are like layers of technology that if they existed might help. And I can't give you a compelling example right off the bat. I think there are these like intermediary layers where standardization is not only helpful, but necessary, um, but building a whole stack or building a common um, shared infrastructure across all the, the diversity of the projects that we've been looking at. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I think because they're all using not only are they all relying on a different existing set of standards and recombining them in interesting ways, but their end goals are different. So some of them are trying to develop new data um, and analysis services. Some of them are trying to develop publishing workflows and some of them are um, trying to connect to data that exists in whole different technology stacks and whole different domains of work. And so my suspicion is probably too diverse for us to be ready for something like that yet, but um, standardization at those intermediate layers is probably, probably imperative. I don't know. What do you think, Diana, Nikki? Yeah, I, well, I do think there's a little bit of a, I think the, there is still some, um, you know, nervousness around whether anyone's betting on the wrong horse. And so there is something to the, the things like Wikidata that like enough people feel that like it's safe enough to invest the time in that it's not going away to, to be an incentive um, on that sustainability piece. Um, but I think in part that's successful because it's not a paid product, and right. So there's a lot of nervousness around in, in these very low resource cultural heritage environments to like investing in something. So um, yeah, so there's been a lot. I think there's in some ways, as we've talked about, I think there's been more investments sometimes in these like systems that are like wrappers, right? That like help you trend. You're not going to like redo your whole infrastructure. You just have a, like a linked data service that, you know, can output something as linked data and then decide if somebody else out there wants to use it, right? And so it's like a, a yes and without having to actually go whole hog on restructuring your back end of how you've organized things. Yeah, agreed. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you to all um, of our presenters. What a great slate we had. And to all of our volunteers who made this happen. Um, this actually ends this segment of the program. So you will need to leave this Zoom room and come back in 15 minutes. I'm going to paste the Zoom link for the next um, session in the chat so you can have it um, ready right there. Thanks again, everybody. And I will see you at the next session. Bye-bye.